Welcome to the first session of the Epic of Eden, the Book of Psalms. I'm Sandy Richter, the Robert H. Gundry Chair of Biblical Studies at Westmont College in Santa Barbara, California. For those of you who know me, you know I am a veteran of many years in the classroom, from Harvard University to Asbury Seminary to Wheaton College, from Tallahassee to Lubbock, Houston to Boulder Creek, and dozens of places in between. And I am so glad that you are here. Thank you to all the faithful fans of the Epic series. I pray that this study finds a place among your people, a place of encouragement, of discipleship, growth, and joy. Our topic for these eight weeks is the Book of Psalms, perhaps the most beloved book in our Christian Bibles. This anthology of prayers and praises is so familiar to us that quotations have found their way onto refrigerator magnets and cross-stitch patterns, dedicatory plaques and national monuments, song lyrics, and movie scripts. Even Edmund Hall, the philosophy building of Harvard University, and the scenic overlooks of the Grand Canyon quote our Book of Psalms. Although I'm sorry to say that those at the Grand Canyon were actually removed in 2003, but that's another story. The Psalms are so familiar to the Christian faith that this Old Testament book is often published as an appendix to the New Testament. But even in all of that familiarity, the great Old Testament theologian, Claus Vestermann, he was absolutely right when he said that the Psalms belong to a world which is no longer our world. Let me say that again. The Psalms belong to a world which is no longer our world. Think about that. Israel's religion was a religion of temples and priests, sacrifice, blood, fire. Theirs was a world in which church and state were completely intertwined, where on any given holy day, the commander in chief, that would be the king, could be seen dancing down Main Street, celebrating the fact that the priests were delivering the Ark of God to the temple. And like, when was the last time you brought a goat to a worship service? Yeah? And if you did indeed decide to bring a goat or an ox, two doves, how many of you would expect your pastor to help you dispatch that creature as an act of worship? Yeah, I thought so. No, that isn't our covenant and that isn't our world, but that is the world of the Book of Psalms, the hymn book of ancient Israel, a world long, long ago and far, far away, a world that actually ceased to exist more than 2,000 years ago. But miraculously, the faith, the reverence, the celebration, the lament of the ancients that's preserved in the Book of Psalms, that has not ceased to exist. Rather, the songs, the prayers of our forefathers in the faith continue to speak to us today. The great fourth century church father Athanasius said it this way, the Psalms have a unique place in the Bible because whereas most of the scripture speaks to us, the Psalms speak for us. The Psalms speak for us. The Psalms pray for us. What a true and powerful world. When I can't wrap words around what I'm feeling, when the heavens seem like they're made of brass and I'm lobbing baseballs off of that brass, when my prayers are bouncing back in my own brain, when the hounds of hell are snapping at my heels, when darkness is all I can see, the Psalms, they pray for me, for me. This is the only book in the Bible that is intended for immediate application to the reader. No filter. This book, you can flip open and start praying whatever you see because it was designed that way. So for centuries, this book has served as the go-to for Jewish and Christian worship. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, you remember him? The Cost of Discipleship? The Lutheran pastor who died at the age of 39 in a Nazi concentration camp? He says that in the Psalter is un suspected power, and if we lose it, an incomparable treasure vanishes from the Christian church. 
My goal in these eight weeks is to plug you into that power, into this book gifted to each of us by that great assembly of witnesses who walk the road ahead of us, who await our arrival at the journey's end, our ancestors in the faith. My prayer is that in this curriculum, you will find the help, the structure, the accountability that you need for a deep dive into this sacred testimony of the living faith of our spiritual mothers and fathers. Allow their words to sink into your soul. Let them put words to your frustration, your joy, your despair. Draw strength from their faith. Find hope in their confidence and let them pray for you. And let's learn again that the Lord of heaven and earth has never ceased and will never cease to hear the cries of his people. You ready? Let the adventure begin. Okay, our first question then is what is the book of Psalms? Well, the name of the book of Psalms is Tahlim in Hebrew. It means songs, or it can be translated praises as well. In other words, these are the prayers that are poetry that are also song. So the book of Psalms is a collection, a culled collection of the praises and prayers of Israel. The best way to think about this book is to think about the book as a hymn book, to think about the hymn book of ancient Israel, because these prayers and praises were gathered together into what we know as the book of Psalms for a purpose. What was that purpose? Well, the purpose was the same purpose as your hymn book. So let's, let's think about that idea for just a moment. What exactly is a hymn book? What does a hymnal do? Well, it collects together in a single text everything a congregation needs in order to worship as a congregation. And it organizes that material for easy access to the individual worshiper. Yeah, there's a table of context, there's an index at the back, and generally there's a very intentional structure to the book. Well, guys, Israel's hymn book had the exact same purpose. And when you hold your book of Psalms, you're holding Israel's hymn book. A hymn book that gathered together everything that these people needed to worship as a congregation. And this hymn book, the book of Psalms, facilitated the worship of Israel for over a thousand years. A thousand years. That's a very long time. Okay, so what kind of pieces are in the book of Psalms? Well, hymns, yes. Laments, yes. Dedicatory prayers, why, yes again. Responsive readings, yep. Were they actually used in real Israelite worship? Well, yes, again. Big surprise. In fact, it was a guy named Herman Gunkel. Think about that name for a moment. Herman Gunkel. In case you're choosing a name for your firstborn this week, I would not recommend Herman Gunkel. But back in the 19th century, this was a very cool name to have. And this particular scholar was the first one who started asking the question like, hey, did anyone ever actually like pray these prayers? Did they ever sing these songs? And if so, when did they do it? So it was Gunkel who first began to push the guild to start asking the question and thinking about where these various pieces came from, who wrote them, why, and most importantly, most importantly, how were they used? So, for example, let's take a look at our own hymnals. Yeah? Do you know the song, Up From the Grave He Arose? You heard that one? When do you sing that song? Christmas? Labor Day? Of course not. We sing that song at Easter, and as soon as you hear the chords coming over the piano, the organ, or uh, some synthesizer who doesn't typically play uh, hymns, you know it's Easter morning. Because when the congregation of faith starts singing up from the grave he arose, we all know that that particular piece goes with our highest holy day, the resurrection of the Christ. How about a little town of Bethlehem? What form is that? Do we sing that one at Easter? 
Well, not unless your pastor's like super confused. No, we sing a little town of Bethlehem at Christmas. And we might sing it all the way up to Christmas, but it has to do with the Advent season. Or how about if someone is standing in front of the congregation and you start hearing the words, friends, this is the joyful feast of the people of God. They will come from east and west, from north and south, and sit at the table in the kingdom of God. Well, friends, if you're a Presbyterian, you are, are hitting the button right now. I know what that is. I know what that is. That's the communion liturgy. And guess where you'd find it? Yeah, in the hymn book. Or how about this one? Dearly beloved. Do I even need to go any further? We've come together in the presence of God to witness and bless this joining together of this man and this woman in holy matrimony. That is a form that is used for the ritual of marriage. And once again, you can find it in a hymnal. Each of these songs, each of these liturgies has a particular function in our religious life, which to us church-going folk are completely transparent. It does not surprise us when we hear O Little Town of Bethlehem during Advent. But here's the rub. These functions and forms would not be transparent to someone 2,000 years from now. Heck, sometimes our forms aren't even transparent to us. Let's take, for example, a song you know very well, a modern form. The lyrics go something like this. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light? Do I need to go any further? Is there anyone out there that doesn't know that song? Of course you know it. Now my question is, what do you know about that song? Well, if your American history is really good, then you know it was written by Francis Scott Key in 1814. Hmm, as a poem. Did you know that? And the name of the poem is The Defense of Fort McHenry. And you're sitting there saying, Fort McHenry, Fort McHenry, where, where was Fort McHenry? Well, if you're from the Chesapeake Bay area, you know, you're from Baltimore or Washington, D.C., or perhaps the Eastern Shore, then you might know that it was written during the War of 1812, toward the end of the War of 1812, a war that most Americans know almost nothing about, but a war that most historians would tell us really was the Second Revolutionary War. Why? Because at this juncture, the American experiment, it hung in the balance. And on September 12th through 14th, 1814, the Brits were winning. Washington was already in flames. Baltimore was next, and Fort McHenry was supposed to defend Baltimore. The Chesapeake Bay was full of British ships. The bombs were flying through the night. Fort McHenry is lasting through the night while one American who is being retained on the deck of a British ship was watching through the night to see which flag would be raised at dawn. So as the morning mist and the smoke of cannon fire cleared, American Major Armistead rolled out the biggest American flag anyone had ever seen, only 15 stars, commissioned specifically for this conflict. And as that flag unfurled in the dawn's early light, Key was inspired to record the moment in the lines that you and I have known since elementary school. Later, the poem was set to a popular, and this kind of kills me, British drinking song, and retitled The Star-Spangled Banner. Hmm, a song about America defending itself against the Brits set to a British drinking song. This all happened in the 1800s, but it wasn't commissioned as the national anthem until, do you know, do you know, 1931 by Herbert Hoover. Who knows anything about Herbert Hoover? I would just like to say that I graduated from Herbert Hoover Junior High School, in case you're interested. Okay, now for the $64,000 question. How is this regal ritual song that we all recognize that we call our national anthem, how do we use it? How did it function? Answer, sporting events. Sporting events. Does that make any sense at all? Yeah, 
Every one of us sings the song when it's time to throw the first pitch over the mound. We sing this song when all the big guys down on the football field are about to bash each other's heads in. This is how we use our national anthem. That's the function. And the ritual stance, it has one, hand over heart, yeah? Do you sit or do you stand? Do you take your hat on or off? All of those are ritual actions. So we see that the form and the function of some of our pieces of majestic music are not always transparent to us. And the function is sometimes a living fluid thing that isn't easily tracked. And that's what we have to keep in mind as we approach the book of Psalms as well. Oh, and what about the tune thing, right? How much fun is it that the Star Spangled Banner is actually set to a British tune? Is a Star Spangled Banner the only set of lyrics to commandeer somebody else's melody? And the answer, of course, is no. How about the 11, count them 11, church hymns sung to the tune of Danny Boy? He saw beyond my fault and saw my need. No, I'm not going to sing for you anymore, I promise. All right, or if you come from the Jesus movement like I did, Amazing Grace sung to the tune of the House of the Rising Sun. And what's interesting about that is the juxtaposition of the lyrics of both songs is intentional. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound. And of course, the House of the Rising Sun is about a brothel. Hmm. So how about Psalm 22? that opens with, and I quote, to the choir master, to be sung according to the tune of the hind of the dawn. Take a look, you'll be looking through these in your study guides this week. So yes, the hymns of ancient Israel were known to borrow tunes as well. And ultimately, what will be the most important question as we approach our Psalter is not where it came from or even who wrote it, Ultimately, the question here is going to be how the community of faith used it. All right, so let's look at some of these ancient forms. In the book of Psalms, we're going to find hymns, a technical term, meaning a song written to extol the glory and greatness of Yahweh, particularly his mighty acts in Israelite history. You will crash into laments, both community laments and individual laments, which embody a cry for help in a dark and difficult circumstance. The worshiper names his complaint quite loudly, quite emotively, but always concludes by expressing her confidence that Yahweh can change the situation if he chooses to, and with a vow to praise Yahweh regardless of his response. You're gonna crash into liturgical readings these psalms had specific uses in a specific worship event. There will be covenant renewal liturgies, which can be found in Psalms 50 and 81. There are royal psalms used for the enthronement of the king. Psalm 2 is going to draw a lot of attention from us over the course of our weeks together. You're going to be working through all of these in your workbooks. And in your study guides, you'll also be introduced to enthronement psalms, which are specific to announcing Yahweh's sovereignty over the world, Psalms 47, 93, 96 through 99. These celebrate the reign of Yahweh present and future. They're royal psalms, which are used for royal weddings, coronations, and prayers after battle. How much fun that all of this is in your Psalter. What was the function? of these psalms? Well, Lesore, Hubbard, and Bush, in their well-used Old Testament survey, say it this way. In their feasts and fasts, their daily worship and their special celebrations, the people of Israel remembered and relived, I like that, remembered and relived God's past victories, committed themselves to present obedience of the covenant laws, which called for full loyalty to Yahweh and anticipated future triumphs, especially the ultimate defeat of Yahweh's foes. That's what the Psalms were. And before we're done with this study, I will argue that that is what they still are. But what you need to know right now in our very first section is that the book of Psalms is a collection. It's a collection and it's a culled 
collection as well of the very best of Israel's songs and prayers. Not every psalm ever written has wound up in your collection of 150 psalms in the book of Psalms. That kind of messes with you, doesn't it? A lot of the psalms that were written and used by Israel in worship didn't make the cut. Huh, that's kind of weird. There are actually a slew more psalms to be found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, which date to about 250 BC. Let's put them there. David is said in the Dead Sea Scrolls to have written 4,050 psalms. That's almost as many as Charles Wesley. All right, there are psalms, hymns, prayers, and laments also scattered all over your Bibles, which you may not have recognized as hymns, prayers, and laments. But what about Moses' song? The Song of the Sea in Exodus 15, I will sing unto the Lord for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and the rider has been thrown into the sea. That's a hymn of praise. What about Hannah's song in 1 Samuel chapter 2 where she gives thanks that God has heard her prayer and rewarded her with the baby Samuel? How about Mary's song? You know it as the Magnificat in Luke chapter 1. Oh my gosh, they're still writing hymns and psalms in the New Testament even. And once again, Mary gives thanks that the God that she worships have overturned her enemies and have given her a future and a hope and a life that she can celebrate. Yes, so under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the long-lived community of faith collected and culled and organized all of these pieces that facilitated worship until our ancient hymnal was complete and highly structured. As you look at the slide on your screen, you're looking at a presentation of the five-part presentation of the book of Psalms. You're noticing that there are five books, just like, hmm, that would be the five books of the Torah. And in this very carefully compiled collection, you have something akin to Chris Tomlin's How Great Is Our God? The Essential Collection, 2011, or perhaps The Very Best of Hillsong Live, 2010. Not every song that Tomlin has ever recorded made The Essential Collection, yeah? Not every piece that Hillsong ever sang made the live album in 2010, but The Essential Ones did. All right, what about the structure of the collection? Well, uh, the collection is indeed structured. Again, the, the goal is to make it accessible, accessible to the congregation and accessible to the individual worshiper. There are indeed five books total. Each collection is actually named, and it's named in your Bible. When you get to the end of Psalm 41 and you turn the page, you will see in bolded print a subheading just under Psalm 41 that says Book 2. Huh, is that the editorial work of the NIV translation team? Nope, that is the biblical authors letting you know that the first book of the collection has concluded. Do you know what else you'll find at the end of book one? You'll find a doxology. The last verse of Psalm 41 reads as follows. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting, amen and amen. In fact, each one of these five books will close with a doxology. And then the book of Psalms, well, as a whole, it will end with a doxology of doxologies. Psalm 150. Notice as well that the culminating line of Psalm 72 in your Bibles, in your Bibles, that is Psalm 72, verse 20. It reads, the prayers of David, the son of Jesse, are ended. Again, NIV translation committee? No. Those are the original writers of your sacred text, letting you know that the two collections that have been attributed to David, that have been dedicated to David, are concluding. Once again, your biblical writers are cluing you in to the table of contents of their anthology. The first book belongs to the Davidic collection, and so does the second, and then there are three more yet to come. We'll talk about all of this more as we move forward. What is the point of this structure? Well, right now, I want you to notice the lens that our biblical author has placed on this collection. 
We've got our five books, our five sub-collections, but the introduction, like every good book, sets the agenda. And Psalm 1 is a Torah psalm. Psalm 2 is a messianic psalm. What does that structure tell us? What do we learn from the way the ancients have put this book together? We learn that by the time this anthology, this ancient hymn book, found its way into its final form and found its way into our hands, the biblical authors wanted their audience to have two truths stamped on their hearts. The first, that the Torah, the law, the character, the covenant of our God is our foundation. You cannot walk through this door without that truth. And so the first Psalm is a Torah Psalm. Two, that Messiah is our hope. We, the community of faith, have nowhere to go if we are not headed toward the new kingdom he is bringing. So the Torah, our foundation, our past, we might say, I like that, and the Messiah, our hope, our future, we might say. And of course, all of this wrapped up in the jubilant words of the final doxology of Psalm 150. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his acts of power. Praise him for his surpassing greatness. Praise him with the sounding of the trumpet. Praise him with the harp and the lyre. Praise him with the timbrel and dancing. Praise him with strings and pipe. Praise him with a clash of cymbals. Praise him with the resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Our foundation is the law. Our hope is the Messiah. Our congregation is the church eternal. And our focus is the Almighty. Let everything that has breath use that breath to praise Yahweh. All right, get your homework done and I'll see you in the next session.